Thank you for joining after lunch. I know that's always a hard one, but uh, we get the time slots we get. Uh, I'd like to talk to you today about um, the real world performance advantages of NVDIM and NVMe, um, mostly focused on NVDIM. And I'm doing that by uh, using an open ZFS file server as uh, the ecosystem we're looking at things in. Um, having gone to SDC for many years now, there's always, uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, persistent memory and NVMe, um, and the performance numbers presented are, are you know, as, as fast as you can get. So what happens when you put, I wanted to see what happens when you put those devices in a real system. Um, so let's, let's get to it, if I can figure out how to advance my slides. Okay, hopefully that will work from now on. Um, so to start out with, I'm gonna do what I just said I, I didn't like very much and walk you through some uh, performance, uh, a device performance survey of uh, flash and persistent memory devices, mostly flash devices, but some different technologies. Um, and I'm going to start by saying what aspect of performance I think matters most when you're looking at uh, strictly flash and persistent memory devices. I don't know if you all will agree with me, but I'll, I'll tell you what I think. Um, and then we'll get into the real world example um, using uh, persistent memory and, and flash devices as a slog device in an OpenZFS file server. Um, I will explain what that means. If you have no idea what an S-log device is, we'll walk through just some fundamentals of how OpenZFS works. And then we'll go into a slog uh, type performance survey uh, with the persistent memory and flash devices. Uh -oh. Oh, it worked, okay. <laughs> so I think that synchronous write latency is really the key when you're comparing flash devices and persistent memory devices to each other. Um, it, 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 I think it really shows the differences between the different technologies very well, um, and we're gonna look at some of those results. Um, I will say don't forget the maximum mebibytes per second that you, you can get. Often you're limited by either your interconnect or your controller on the actual device, um, which is easy to get caught out by. So talking about the interconnect performance, um, let me grab my pointer here. Uh, technology. So wh why do we care about NVMe? Uh, NVMe are, is the, the red bars here. You can see, you know, we started out in life, this is your, our maximum peak performance that the interconnect will do in one direction. Uh, we started back in the old days, SATA 1 and 2. Uh, SAS is in gold. Um, so for our enterprise types, we're pretty much on SAS 3 solidly across the industry. I don't think there's any SAS 4 out there. I could be wrong. Um, but you can see that, that NVMe just by 2 and keep in mind, if you're dual porting your NVMe drives, you will be restricted to buy two, at least in most of the cases. Um, I think I heard, I had a conversation where someone said that wasn't strictly true. Um, but in general, if you do have a dual ported NVMe device, you know, the four lanes will be split, so two go to each controller. But if you're doing buy four, and of course this is with PCIe Gen 3. Um, with uh, a buy four device, you know, you're, you're obviously way ahead of everything else. Um, so it's really, it's really awesome to see that a single device can get you know, that many mebibytes per second. But why do we care about NVDIM? Now, the exact number here may be in dispute because in all my years of doing storage performance, I've been focused on storage performance my whole career, about uh, 12, 13 years now. Um, I've never cared about the memory speed. It's always been, if we're hitting memory, we're good. So I've never even really thought about evaluating it. Um, of course, in OpenZFS, you know, the whole goal is to be operating at memory speed most of the time. Um, but I've only recently started looking at OpenZFS. Um, so, but you know, we can just see, you know, what can you get out of your memory bus? The, the potential bandwidth is, is so much higher uh, than even NVMe. So, that's why persistent memory is, is such a hot thing.
So let's jump back to what I was talking about before we got into sidetracked on interconnects. Why do, why, is, why do I think synchronous write performance is a key differentiator? Um, I think it boils down to the usual thing where you can have something fast, safe, and cheap. Oh no, you can't. You can pick two of those things in most cases. So you, do you want to be fast and safe or fast and cheap or, well, uh, safe and cheap? I guess that's good too. Um, in general, in, in, flash, in, in flash devices that you use, um, if you are fast and safe, then usually there's some power fail safe cache, usually just super caps. Generally, that's the differentiator between enterprise devices and consumer devices. Um, and even prosumer and uh, enterprise, that gets a little bit murky. I was trying to pressure the Intel guys on whether my consumer Optane was power fail safe or not, and uh, I didn't quite get an answer, but um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, obviously hard drives are slow. Um, so, yeah, writes, reads, uh, it all is kind of not great when you're dealing with a hard drive, at least in our new paradigm of NVMe devices and persistent memory. Um, but, you know, write isn't that great for NAND flash either because that's, that's been the whole evolution um, and the whole difference between, you know, enterprise devices and consumer devices. How much extra capacity do you have to avoid wear out and ensure you have good performance, you don't have to wait for a whole bunch of cells to be erased before you can actually write to them. So it's no walk in the park for NAND flash. I will say that, I mean, flash, I think it's easy enough, it's easy for flash to be fast enough. It's like when all flash arrays first started, it didn't really matter what you did, it was so much faster than what things were before that it's like, it was fast enough. But now that we have new devices, we have like Optane, 3D crosspoint technology, we have NVMe coming in, now there's more differentiation between all flash arrays. A basic all flash array now may not be fast enough for you. It's the same with the device layer. Um, and so, like I said, usually you're limited by your controller or your interconnect for your single flash devices, unless you're using NVMe. So I decided uh, when I started at IX Systems uh, almost a year ago now, um, I started buying, I moved to Tennessee, so I, I had a little bit more money than where I used to live. So I started buying devices gratuitously off Newegg. And my, some of my coworkers joined in on this. And because we're, we're a big free BSD shop, um, there actually is a benchmark that's sort of been imp improved. Uh, and it's not actually that old, but it, the disk info command, if you use dash W and S, um, it'll actually do a really quick single-threaded synchronous write test. The intent there is to actually test the suitability of a device for an OpenZFS slog device. So that sort of led to this whole presentation. Um, so as I bought more devices, as other people bought more devices, as our company bought more devices and we brought them in, the first thing we did was we ran a, this quick test. Now, it's not incredibly scientific. Uh, different hosts were used, they weren't really normalized. It is a quick test, and the devices did range from new to very well aged. But despite this, uh, we have some cool numbers to work with um, and uh, work up the stack. So let's start with hard drive based storage. So we know it's slow, but whatever. Um, it served us well for all these years, and with ZFS actually there's a pretty good case for using hard drives still. So I looked at a, uh, two 7.2K hard drives. One is just a consumer laptop um, uh, hard drive, 2.5 inch. The other is a 10 terabyte, again consumer, but an HGST helium drive. And uh, the other one was a cool thing. I, I got a laptop off eBay and it had a 500 gig um, hybrid hard drive. So an SSHD, so briefly these were I guess considered a good idea. I think they're sort of fading out of existence. But they have a small amount of flash in them. And you know, the idea was at least you could acknowledge some writes pretty quickly because they're safe. And I don't know how safe they really are. But also you could cache hot reads. Now Intel's doing the same thing with their Optane devices now, or they're trying to push that. So this isn't a totally lost concept, but that is with discrete devices. So anyway, <laughs> if we look at at the, the two lines down here, the blue line and the red line, these are the two just basic hard drives. And we're looking at the ops per second, so higher is better, 
and we're looking at what happens to performance as we scale up I.O. size from 512 bytes, uh, you know, 1K, and then up by powers of 2, up to 8 megs. So we can see that our, our basic hard drives, my cheap laptop hard drive is, you know, well down in about, you know, 60, uh, is that 60 ops per second? Yeah, it's around 60 ops per second. You know, the large, new, modern one is around 100, 120 ops per second or so here at the peak with, with smaller I.O. sizes. And there are a few wobbles in there. The real surprise to me was that when we look at the hybrid hard drive, um, we're, we're up here at 1,000 ops per second. So that's actually equating to about one millisecond for these small I.O. sizes in this part of the curve. So that's actually really good latency, as we'll see in the next slide. Um, but the pure hard drives are in the tens of milliseconds, um, 10 to 30 milliseconds um, for these synchronous writes. Again, single-threaded synchronous writes is all we're looking at here. So let's keep that the red line, which is going to change colors, but it's the 10 terabyte hard drive, and let's keep our SSHD, just because it's a weird device. And you know, one millisecond latency, it's still an order of magnitude better than those hard drives for this test. So next, let's step up to the consumer SATA SSD level. Um, I had three of these that I chose from, a uh, Crucial MX300, 500 gigs, uh, Team Light, uh, which was, I think, two for like 35 bucks on Newegg. So a very inexpensive, small 120 gig drive. And uh, a 500 gig Mushkin reactor, which I bought for my L2 ARC and my FreeNAS Mini at home. <laughs> um, so consumer SATA SSDs are also around one millisecond. So we can see they're hovering around the same as that hybrid hard drive, which is now the red line right here that's dotted. So we can see here that, you know, they're, they're about the same. Um, the, uh, the really, the cheaper uh, SSD, the team group one, is a little bit more inconsistent. Again, it's a very short test, so with more con conditioning, that may have gone away. But we can see it's about on par with the other one, and for some reason, the Mushkin uh, drive uh, was lagging behind a little bit. But we're all in the same region. We're, we're one order of magnitude higher than the hard drives the pure hard drives. So these are great. Um, we need to remember they may not be power fail safe. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure none of them are. Um, so they're cheap and fast. So for this example, let's, let's keep the yellow line here. That's the Crucial MX300. Um, it's a very stable curve, and it's a pretty good representative sample. So let's go up the stack one more level, and let's look at, at what do enterprise SATA or SAS SSDs look like. So the SATA device here is just an Intel DC S3700. This is where we get into the well-aged category. This drive has been on for about four years. <laughs> um, but the endurance actually is pretty good, according to the Intel tool and the smart stats. So it's been sitting around doing nothing for most of its life. So that's the green line right here. So we can see that even though it's an enterprise SATA SSD, it's still around one millisecond in the smaller I.O. size region. Um, it actually is a little bit slower than that MX300. Um, but we do know that this device is power fail safe. So if we unplug, if we unplug it with no warning, you know, we're not going to lose data that's actually been acknowledged. That's guaranteed to us. Um, the other devices I looked at are uh, just some SAS SSDs, um, two HGSTs, an Ultrastar SS300, and a SSD MHB. <laughs> I forget which line exactly that is. Um, but one's 400, one's 100. Um, you know, the 100 gig one is a high endurance. The 400 gig one is, is a lower endurance. Um, and I also dug up an old stack uh, Zeus IOPS drive, which is actually just DRAM and an old six gig SAS with a six gig SAS controller in front of it with, uh, I assume it's capacitors to keep it safe. So it can dump to flash if it loses power, but it's sort of like the first NVDIM just with SAS. Um, they were really cool, they were just really expensive. Uh, but we can see here that the enterprise SAS SSDs, you know, they're all clustered here. So again, we've moved up one order of magnitude. We're around 0.1 milliseconds in terms of latency with our synchronous riots. And you can see actually for the small IOPS, you know, that Zeus IOPS drive is doing very well, especially considering it's, you know, an old six gig SAS device. 
Um, but we can see it, it does fall off as we get into more of a bandwidth workload. So it does get limited by the interconnect. Um, and the other drives just sort of fall off as well. Um, so let's keep the 400 gig uh, HGST SS300. Um, that one sort of has the, a nice balanced curve. So what's our next stop? Our next stop is the world of NVMe. So unfortunately, I only had two 960 Evos kicking around. All my pros were in use, and I didn't feel like destroying all the data on them. Um, but we can see here that, at least for these devices, and I really would have loved to test a pro. I just did not have a pro, and I, all of my other NVMe SSDs were just busy. I could not extract them. So, you know, hey, if you install FreeBSD, send me your numbers, and I'll update the charts. <laughs> um, but you can see that they're actually in the same realm as the normal SATA flash, which this surprised me. I thought, you know, maybe, maybe they'd be a little bit better. They weren't, and there actually was a, a difference between the 500 gig and the 250 gig. The 500 gig drive was actually slower than the smaller drive. So maybe it has more extra space, uh, or who knows, maybe there's, I, there shouldn't be a controller difference. So I really can't explain that. Um, but you can see there, they're in the same realm, they're in the same SATA flash realm, even though they are NVMe devices, but they are consumer devices. So the next step, with some very exciting devices here, the sort of prosumer and enterprise NVMe realm, uh, really just one enterprise, the 1.6 terabyte Samsung PM1725A, um, you see that, and I've seen that in a couple presentations here at SDC. Um, but also an HGST SN150, um, that was pretty well used, but that's a PCIe form factor. I believe the SSD 750 Intel is as well. Um, that was run by a coworker in a, another continent, so I never saw that device. But you can see here, we haven't quite jumped up another order of magnitude um, for the small IO sizes, at least transactional stuff, you know, but we're doing fairly well. We are at, um, where are we? The, so we're at around 20 to 30 microseconds there. That's equating here to about 80,000 ops, uh, 60 to 80,000 ops or so, if I had to guess. Um, so that's pretty cool. We can see that there are some differentiations here in the mid IO sizes. Um, there's a few wobbles going on. Again, maybe with a, a longer running test that would, that would change. I mean, I'm not running the whole S3 test suite to precondition the drives and delete all the content and all that. Um, but this is just a quick, a quick example. So, but we can see they do follow the same trend line. So let's walk forward with the uh, Intel uh, 750. Now, I have a fondness in my heart for Optane devices, and despite the Intel logo on the back of my shirt, I'm not paid to say that. I just think they're really cool. Um, so the first Optane devices that I'm aware that Intel released were the 16 gig and the 32 gig uh, M.2 Optane devices. And for the price, uh, I thought, wow, that's gonna be a really good slog device because we don't need a lot of capacity and it should be very fast and should have high endurance. Um, and we can see here that even though these devices cost in the order of $100 and change, um, we can see the latency for small IOs is absolutely fantastic. It's the same as our prosumer and enterprise NVMe flash devices. So we're ranging from you know, uh, tens of microseconds up here, uh, almost 100,000 ops per second, synchronous writes. Um, but they do, they do have bandwidth limits. And as you, as you roll up your I.O. size, we can see they, they fall through the entire spectrum of devices all the way down. The small one gets, it matches the, uh, the, the hard drive right there, the, uh, that HGST helium drive. Um, so it's very interesting. Like, you know, Optane is, you know, with these small Optane devices with one or two chips on them, you know, you're hitting, it's either a controller limit or it's actually the, you know, the chip. I don't know the architecture of it, but you're hitting basically a controller limit for the device. So that's why you see this line peel off so quickly. Um, and you do get more out of the 32 gig versus the 16 gig Optane. So it's, it's very interesting. It's a device that spans all of the, latency, the, the whole IOPS range, depending on your IO size. So it's pretty cool. Now, 
newer Optane devices released and my wallet cried out for help, um, but I couldn't help but buy them. So I got 118 gig, the Optane 800P, that's an M.2 form factor, and uh, also a 480 gig Optane 900P. I wish I had the 905P, but that's like as much as a mortgage payment, at least in Tennessee. <laughs> so I don't have that one yet. Um, but that one, the 900P is actually a PCIe form factor device. And you can see here that if we look at the 118 gig, which is the, uh, the yellow line here, we can see it follows the same curve as the other M.2 devices, but it certainly is a little bit more favorable. Um, and the latency, again, is very good up here. Instead of falling out, you can see the difference down here is not that, that big. Um, we're comparing against the, the pink dotted line right here versus that um, yellow line. So again, even, even though it's 120 gigs and you know, it's, a, it's a lot better, um, you know, it's a marginal bump, but the price is also very low. Now the 480 gig Optane has tons of chips. I assume a much better controller. And uh, I believe it's electrically the same as like the data center version. Um, so we can see here that it surpasses, I mean, we'll forgive it for this little, little difference here, but you can see that it exceeds the uh, very, very expensive, well, I guess not very expensive, but um, the fairly expensive 1.2 terabyte Intel SSD 750. And remember, that was about the same as the Samsung you know, Enterprise NVMe device. So this is, I mean, this is really impressive. We have one device, we're doing synchronous writes to it, and we're getting basically 100,000 ops per second. But NVDIMs move us up basically almost another order of magnitude even from that. We're talking uh, 2.5 microsecond latencies and 400,000 ops per second. So and this is with a 16 gig NVDIM uh, in our system. Now, every write sent to this device is actually being mirrored to another controller over PCIe interconnect before it gets acknowledged. And, and we're still here. So I, I, need, I need to power off one of my other controllers and run this test again. I've been running tests too, too hard and fast to actually stop and power off one of my controllers. Um, but even with mirrored writes, this is what we're seeing. Um, and we're also using the NVDIM device, not as memory, but we're actually using it as, we have a shim layer that sort of treats it as an actual like disk device, disk-ish device. Um, so even with all that considered, it's still beating everything. <laughs> so that's really cool to see. So that's the survey of, of, of single device performance. You didn't come here for that, you, you, know, you could do that yourself. Um, but I did it for you, and I, I have a lot of flash devices to prove it. So let's talk about a more real world example uh, using these devices as a slog, which is what this benchmark was intended to assess the, you know, whether it would be a good fit or not. So for those of you not familiar with OpenZFS, I'm gonna go over a quick overview. So we have our open, FreeBSD plus OpenZFS server here, um, which is you know, one of the products we sell. Inside of the server, we have the front end, so NIC or HBA, where data comes in from. Um, we have system memory, a portion of which is used for ARC. Um, and then we have a bunch of disks. So these are just 7.2K hard drives, in my case. Those are the data VDEVs. That's where all the data resides when it's considered safe and it's protected by RAID and checksums and all that good stuff. And so those are in a Z pool. So just a storage pool, ZFS storage pool. Um, and then we also have some slog VDEVs and some L2ARC VDEVs. So we'll get into all those. But let's take a look at ARC. ARC is the adaptive replacement cache in ZFS. It's a global system-wide cache that is composed of main memory. And a storage appliance, usually almost all the memory in the system goes into this cache. It's shared by all the pools that are on a system. And it's used to store or cache, now it's not a read cache. It's adaptive replacement cache, not read cache. That's a, an important uh, distinction. So actually all income, incoming data goes to the ARC first. And then also your hottest data and your metadata, to what extent it can, will be placed in ARC. So it can be serviced with the fastest speed possible. 
And the ARC actually balances its usage as cache between most frequently used data and most recently used data. So it's a fairly smart cache. So now let's talk about the L2 arc. If we just talked about the arc, let's talk about L2 arc. Now you'll see it's in a much different place. So L2 arc, your level two adaptive replacement cache, actually resides on one or more storage devices. And those devices are in the pool. So these devices will only service IOs going to a single pool. Usually, these devices are flash devices, usually read intensive. Um, obviously, the data has to be written there, but the idea is that it's written there once and then read back many times. Uh, and uh, let's see, what else did I want to say here? Uh, so this caches the warm data and metadata, if, if there is any, that doesn't fit in ARC. So stuff doesn't really get directly evicted to ARC, but it, stuff does get moved to L2 ARC. Um, so if you have a lot of active data, some will reside in ARC, and then some will, will be pushed out to L2 ARC if it's read a lot. That's weird. Oh, okay, no. <laughs> I put the red lines there to show you where the ZIL is. So the ZIL is the ZFS intent log. So it's sort of like a journal. Uh, by default, the ZIL actually resides on the data disks in the pool. It just round robins using different VDEVs inside of the pool. What this does is it's used to quickly store synchronous write operations onto persistent storage so you can acknowledge them. Um, so you, you, you can just, all the data sits in, oh, well, we'll go through exactly what that means later with a diagram. It's hard to explain in words. Um, so the client requests, if, if incoming data comes in, the client request can be acknowledged if it's a synchronous write once the data is logged to, to Zill because that's on persistent storage. Um, from this, uh, the data is later written into the pool from main memory um, via transaction group. So we'll see a demonstration, an animation of that in a few slides here. The last thing I want to talk about is the slog, S log, whatever you want to call it. That's actually a separate ZFS intent log, S log. Mr. Dexter has done a lot of explanation of this, and I, I pulled from some of his materials on the IX Systems webpage because it's a very hairy subject that confuses um, people. It is it is confusing even for me. Um, I'm fairly new to OpenZFS. Um, so the optional slog. It resides on one or more storage devices again, and it's associated with a single pool, just like L2 arc. Um, here you definitely want flash or better, um, but it has to be very high endurance. There will be, unless something goes wrong, there are never any reads from this device, but any synchronous writes are written to this device and, and logged there, um, so there are a lot of writes. So again, it's added in a single pool, so it only services this single pool. And um, this will just, it allows your ZIL to be separated from your primary pool storage. Um, so in some cases, that really can help your performance a lot. Now, you may not need a ZIL, but there are, ZIL stat is one utility that comes to mind to let you know if you're using your ZIL heavily and whether, you can, then you can consider maybe separating it out and putting it on a separate device to increase your performance. You have to be very careful though, because if you choose the wrong device here and you hit a bandwidth limit, that's gonna be your bandwidth limit if you're doing all synchronous writes or NFS, for example. Um, you know, you can be, if I put that small Optane in here, I'm gonna get like 250 megs per second maximum with NFS, because it's all gonna be bottlenecked through the slog. So let's walk through what happens during an asynchronous write to open ZFS. I'm gonna have to hit the button here a lot. <laughs> So we have a, a request, uh, data comes in over our front end, the NIC or the HBA, and the system shuttles that forward to OpenZFS. So OpenZFS immediately accepts the write, puts the data into ARC, which is main system memory, and then once that's done, it can acknowledge that back to the client. So at the next transaction group, which about every five seconds, uh, that data will then be moved down onto the data VDEVs in the pool, and the data, and that gets co it's copied from ARC to the data VDEVs in the pool, 
The data does remain in ARC because it's most recently used, um, but it's not dirty anymore. So it won't, nothing will be lost. The data is safe on the hard drives after the transaction group. I think it's pretty similar to like other copy on write uh, file systems if you're familiar with any of those. Uh, like Waffle springs to mind for me. It's not exactly the same though. <laughs> so how does, this, how does this change when we're doing a synchronous write and we have, a we're, we have a slog device in our pool? So just like before, and I've bolded the steps that are different here, just like before, the request comes in, OpenZFS handles it, but in, the data is written both to the ARC and to the S log. As soon as the data hits the S log, that can be act back to the client. So at the next transaction group, that data will be moved from ARC, well copied from ARC, down to the uh, data VDEVs in the pool. So now your data is, resides both in ARC and on the, the pool, the actual hard drives, the persistent storage. And it is technically in the slog, but once the transaction group happens, we don't care anymore, and that'll be overwritten at a later date. So the data comes from ARC, it, we never read from the slog. The, only, the slog is only used if there was a power fail event, and then we had to replay that log to restore the pool to the state that was acknowledged to the clients. So that's the intro of, of, of th that's how this log is used. So you can see, that now for NFS, everything is gonna be going through, through this log, if you have one in your pool, because everything is treated as a synchronous write there, or as a synchronous operation. And uh, you can see, if everything's going through this device, you want this device to be as fast as possible. Like I said, if you use that small Optane device, you'll get stuck at some small number of megabytes per second. And that's just because everything has to go through here to be act and then later committed to the pool. Question? That section I have two, because only writes that are up to a certain size go to the pool. Also writes that are bigger than a certain size can go to the main pool. So it's In Yes, right. So the, the, the assertion was that that's not true because large writes can go directly to the pool and there is the log bias setting um, that you can set uh, per pool, right? Per or per data set, yeah. Um, so with the way it works in, at least with FreeBSD and OpenZFS and the way we have it set up in FreeNAS, um, not many people play with the log bias setting, especially in OpenZFS anymore. Um, and if you do have a slog, everything does go through the slog. It doesn't bypass. It will bypass if it's using the Zill. And that, that, it, there is a setting for that. So let's take a look at some real data here. So what I'm doing, I'm actually using iSCSI for this testing um, because then I can actually set whether I can set sync always um, to make everything go through the S log, or I can set sync standard, and then the S log will just not be used. Um, in this case, I'm running through some worst case scenarios here, basically. Um, we're doing random 4K write um, against eight LUNs, and I'm scaling up thread count, so each of these dots is an additional amount of threads per LUN. Uh, so our baseline here, where we have the best performance, is this blue line right here. So that's with sync standard. So we're not using a slog. We're not going through the zill here. Um, that's our best performance. You can see we're getting, oh, 4,250 or 4,500 ops or so um, at the peak with that thread count. Um, so the next run I did is with, well, let's start from the bottom actually so we can go up in, in uh, order of increasing speed. So I took one of the SSDs that I believe we looked at earlier, the SSD 800 MHB, um, or at least one of the distant relatives of one of them. So that's a single SAS uh, flat, NAND flash device that we're using, oops, as our slog. So we can see here that that device simply can't service all these ops, so we do get bottlenecked. 
now that we're, we're sync always, so all of our I.O. has to go through this log. So we hit this limit. Now, if you recall the charts from earlier, we saw that the Zeus RAM device for small IOs, like 4K IOs, was a little bit faster um, than this HGST Enterprise SaaS device. So if we use the Zeus RAM instead for our slog, we can see that's a little bit, we do get a little bit more performance out of that. Um, now, obviously, we would be bandwidth limited with the Zeus RAM because it's only a six gig SaaS device. Um, but for a transactional workload, that's actually not too much of a concern, although I'd have to do the math to see if it was. I don't think it was. Now, I said you can use one or more devices for your S-log, so I said, okay. Now, I wouldn't recommend doing this, but <laughs> I took these two devices and just threw them both in as, as, as S-log devices for that, for that pool. Now, you probably don't want to use disparate devices, but just for the sake of the example, that's what I had on hand, so that's what I did. We can see using both of those devices, so we'll round robin between them, um, we were able to actually service more I.O. Let's see, what did we get up to there? That's almost, uh, almost 30,000. Um, but we're still well short of where, you know, we're not using the slog. So enter NVDIM. And again, like I said, in, in this scenario, we are actually mirroring all the rights to the other NVDIM and the other controller before we acknowledge anything. Uh, back to the other system so it can acknowledge the client that requested the right. But you can see we, we are, we're not hitting the knee of the curve really early here. Um, we're actually following the same exact shape. Uh, now we have increased the latency a little bit, so that has pushed our, our ops a bit lower for each thread count. Um, but certainly the NVDIM performance is much more favorable than, uh, than any of these uh, SAS flash devices. So again, it's a worst case scenario. You're not often gonna be doing all 4, 4K random writes. And with iSCSI, you, know, you may or may not decide to change the sync setting at all. Um, but this just gives us a nice comparison point of, you know, with NVDIM, we see a totally different shape of that curve. Um, and it matches what we get when we're not even using the slog. So the next test I ran was sequential uh, writes, uh, in this case 128K, and I just did the same thread scaling. Uh, in this case it was 12 LUNs, uh, but the same thread counts. So to build these lines, I just scale up the number of threads, which just scales up the number of outstanding IOs, basically. So our baseline, again, is the blue line with sync standard. So we actually do run into a, a bottleneck here uh, in terms of the thread counts. Um, something happens and, and we're no longer, we're just backing up our queues uh, with the higher thread count there. But you can see we're, we're at about uh, 2,750 mebibytes per second. So let's go back to the slowest first. And I, I should have reversed that. But let's go to the slowest line that we can see here. <laughs> and this is with one of our SAS SSDs again. So what's happened here? We've hit the wall from, from the get-go. Well, if you look at the spec sheet for this drive, it can do about 410 megabytes per second sequential writes. So in this case, the vendor spec sheet is uh, spot on. <laughs> That's all that device can do. Um, so we're not gonna go any faster. Now with NVDIM, you can see again, we have sort of a similar curve. Um, but we're, we're better able to pump bandwidth through the NVDIM. Um, it's not the same, certainly, as uh, when we're, we're not forcing all the data through the slog, um, but this is a, a much more favorable curve and much more favorable perform performance than you, you know, using a SAS SSD that will be bottlenecked here. Now, like we saw before, you could add more SAS SSDs and you get up to that point, but then you're paying for a lot of SAS SSDs and you're taking up your drive base. Whereas if you have a modern motherboard, you have a couple slots that you could easily throw an NVDIM into. And it's, it's far superior with a single device. Uh, in this test, it was, uh, it's a bunch of mirrored 7.2K drives. 
Um, it should be somewhere in the order of, uh, it probably varied. It, it was between 80 and 142 drives. I think in this case it was 142 or 140. I'm trying, I, I know that's sort of interesting information. I'm just trying not to, not, not to focus on, you know, <laughs> what I tested. I'm not trying to sell that product here. Um, so one more chart. <laughs> you'll, you'll notice we had a, a green line that was not evident on the previous chart. That's because I, I zoomed in here so we could better see the shapes of these curves. Um, so what happens if you take all the slog devices out, but you still leave sync always on? in this iSCSI case. Um, so we're gonna use the ZIL that resides on the VDEVs in the pool. So you can see actually doing that, because we have a lot of devices, we can exceed the bandwidth limit that we hit when we had that single SAS log device. Because we're spreading the load over a lot more hard drives, and those hard drives are all 12 gig SAS hard drives. So each one can do you know, at least 150 megs, probably maybe a little bit more, maybe up to 300 or so. Um, but you can see here, you know, we, we can exceed that, we just have higher response time because they're hard drives. So we're using them both to write all the data to, and then we're writing that same data again later when the transaction group hits. Wait, actually, sorry. We're not doing that because it's 128K. That is the case where um, we are bypassing the data. We are still writing um, metadata and, and some other stuff, thank you into the slog and then we have to write that. So we probably are antagonizing the heads and causing some additional seeks. But actually this is, so 32K and above, if when you're using a ZIL, is when you will bypass, the data gets written directly into the pool and it doesn't get copied again. Um, but when, with FreeBSD and FreeNAS, that if you have a slog device, then that doesn't happen. You always go through the slog. Um, and then at the transaction group, the metadata that's changed, that needs to be changed to reflect that new layout on the disk, then gets committed to the actual pool and moved from the zill on the drives. So it's a little bit heady, but you know, it, it's pretty easy to see. You know, you, if you have one single SAS device, you can easily get bottlenecked. You can get very favorable latencies when you're using NV DIMMs, and that does allow for, for fairly good bandwidth as well. Um, but in, 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 in some cases, like with this configuration here versus just not having a slog device, chances are, if this is your workload, you would be better served not having a slog at all. So a slog doesn't always increase your performance. However, <laughs> now with NV DIMM, you may actually consider using an S-log for uh, a workload where you may not have considered it before. So that's all I had. Um, I wanna just thank IX Systems for making this talk possible. I spent a good bit of time and, and some very, uh, very limited availability equipment to run some of these tests. Um, I got my Twitter, GitHub, and email up there. So thank you everyone.